Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our live studio show here on MXGP TV with Lisa Leyland, myself, Paul Malin. Uh, we've got a great show lined up today. It's round 10 of the FIA Motocross World Championship. We're at the MXGP of Germany at Teuschenthal. Uh, Bas Varsen is in place already. We'll talk to him in just a few moments. But we've also got Aminas Jataconis coming in and Lorenzo Resta from X Offroad Magazine. Um, but Lisa, here we are in Germany. We're live, it's Saturday, but yeah. already wishing it was Monday. <laughs> <laughs> well, speak for yourself. It's been full on though, hasn't it? It's the third one in a row. Another one. And we're mid-season, can you believe it? I this know. marks the midway point. The already. halfway stage of the season has just arrived. And yeah. then we get a week off and we go to Indonesia for two weeks. Back out of the bags. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, our first guest is in place. Uh, Bas Varsen from Hitachi KTM UK. Bas Varsen. Fueled. By Milwaukee. Fueled by Milwaukee. Fueled. Yeah. Um, Bass, welcome to our studio show. Uh, former third place finisher in the uh, European Championship. Now your third year in uh, mm -hmm. MX2. Yeah. Um, it's not, uh, I mean, in terms of being in MX2, it's not always been easy, has it? You know, this is probably the best year having. Yeah, definitely. And this year's the year, like, yeah, knock it off, but uh, I haven't had any big injuries. Like, you, you always have, like, small stuff, like, you, like, twist a knee or something, but nothing to put me off the bike. So, no, this year has been going good. It's my first year really being healthy till the halfway st uh, stage. So, no, it's uh, it's going a lot better this year. Yeah, like I said, uh, currently enjoying your your highest finish. Uh, mm. You were tenth after French. You've slipped to eleventh. Um, but in terms of getting this weekend out of the way, all goes well. You mm. could probably crack the top ten and leave here in ninth place. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's the, uh, the plan now to get uh, in into top ten, and then the motor is just going to get good finishes. I'm not really focused about the championship more taking it uh, like from moto to moto, weekend to weekend. So, and if you can perform every single moto, then you know you can get a good result in the end. Yeah. Well, you switched teams in the winter. How are yep. you settling into the British surroundings, and how's the switch been from Honda to KTM? Um, it's been good. It's been more easy than I expected actually mm -hmm. to go from yeah. F since I got on 250s, I always been on Japanese bikes. So mm -hmm. now to get on a European bike, I thought it was going to be a big change, but. No, it felt quite comfortable, quite fast. So, no, it's been good. The team's been awesome. They, uh, they're they really behind me and they uh, really want to push it. So, no, I'm really, really satisfied with the team. And how are you getting on with your teammate, Conrad Muse? And how is, how's he doing? Um, the last thing I heard is was he's doing pretty good. He got mm -hmm. the, ca I think he got the cast off and he can move his wrist already. So, no, he's, uh, I think he's doing pretty good and no, we get along quite well. Mm. Um, I mean, just touching on something you said a moment ago, uh, going from Japanese to Austrian, the, the chain wasn't, uh, wasn't so bad. But when you went from Suzuki to Honda, um, you know, it's, it's kind of the Japanese bikes all feel very, very similar, don't they? But mm -hmm. the, the KTM is very different in that, in that respect. Yeah, it's, um, it felt like the Suzuki. I still think that was, that was a really good bike. Yeah. Like we all in the factory team. It was a really good bike. The chassis and the suspension, everything gels so well. Like you could just go over bumps and the bike wouldn't, wouldn't do anything. Then you went on the Honda. It was a really comfortable bike. The chassis was really comfortable. Mm -hmm. And uh, now on KTM, you feel like if you make a mistake, you get uh, thrown off it quicker. But you can also ride it harder, mm. I feel like. Yeah. And is that to your benefit then? Yeah. yeah. Like this bike, I feel like you can... You can push more with the KTM. Okay, the consequence is a little bit bigger, but you can also push a lot harder. And now it's just, I feel like I'm, I'm feeling really good on the KTM. Okay. Well, look, um, let's go on. Uh, and what would you say has been the biggest thing with holding you back since Ottobiano? I mean, you clearly have the speed to be top five, mm -hmm. but it must be frustrating for you to feel that you're falling short of your goal at the back. Yeah. No, the, in the beginning was the first couple of GPs I did. Mm -hmm. I did the GP in Essen in 2016, I think, and I was running in second for a very mm -hmm. long time. I came just a couple points short of the podium. In Ottobiano, then I came in 2017, I came just short of mm -hmm. the podium. And then, uh, yeah, then I broke my collarbone, and last year was filled with injuries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this year is, for me is more about uh, building back up, getting my reputation back up, and then... Mm -hmm. um, like smoothing out all the points that I need to improve on because yeah, if you lose a year, yeah, you you really miss the mark. So now it's just about being building back up and then 
just wanted to get back to the front. Well, let's talk about Latvia, actually, because um, you just said you missed the podium you know, by a couple of points. You broke the top five again. Second mm -hmm. time you've done that in MX2. You did it a couple of years ago in Ottaviano. Um, but how was, um, you know, how was it being you know, back at the sharp end, fighting inside the top five? I mean, is that giving you uh, a nice confidence again, knowing that you're back to that level? Um, it felt comfortable, actually. Like, just to not be in the craziness and being out front, yeah. Like it, you feel you feel so much more comfor comfor uh, comfortable and confident. So, mm. no, I feel like I'm getting back to where I belong. So, yeah. But like you did say, you looked really comfortable there, and you were passing a lot of guys. You didn't uh, didn't make too many great starts uh, so far this season. You mm -hmm. know, so from that side, you know, it must be easier sort of working from the front than having to do it at the back. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, I'm one of the little bit more heavier, bigger bigger guys. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and the starts is always going to be a little bit of a short, uh, short straw. But we're just, we're focusing a lot on the starts lately, and uh, I think they're improving. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's always easier to sort of like make a good start than having mm, to come from uh, at the back. But um, what about the track conditions here? Obviously, Toyshental. You weren't here last year. You missed mm. it, I think, because of injury. Yeah. Um, and actually, in EMX 250, you've never really, you know, put two solid races together. So is this a track that you like, but it's just never gone your way in the past? Or yeah. Yeah, I, li I like the track. I really enjoy the layout. Um, it gets really rough. It gets really technical. So I really, sorry, I really enjoy that. Mm. And uh, now it's just the point of getting getting together two solid finishes. Yeah. Um, we're just watching the 125 guys out there in their time training session. Mm -hmm. We can see already the, the corners are starting to get quite deep. They look like yeah. they've ripped it quite heavily, certainly in mm -hmm. the corners this year. No, it seems like they they went with a big bulldozer and they really, really ripped it really deep mm. and they put a lot of water on it. And I think that's going to benefit a lot for the Sunday. Then there's going to be many, many lines, many passing points, many uh, points to gain, gain time. So no, I think they did a good job on the track this year. Okay. And uh, finally, as I said, you're in 11th at the moment. You could leave here in 9th if all goes well. What would be your ultimate goal for you this year? Um, I... The moment, the, the moment how it's rolling now, I think top eight, that's going to be my uh, my goal to finish the season in top eight. Okay. Well, look, um, we are out of time with you. Our second guest, I mean, is Jessica Conis, is waiting mm -hmm. to uh, talk to us. But uh, uh, have a good race this weekend Thank and a uh, good uh, rest of the season. Yeah. Uh, Bas Vars and Hitachi KTM UK fueled by uh, Milwaukee. Uh, we will talk to, I mean, it's Jessica Conis in a moment. But before that, let's check the highlights from MX2 Race 2 from Latvia one week ago. <laughs> Kaylee Chervelin, as he could see, the 61 of Prado disappear into the first turn. He propped up Adam Sterry, who looked like he was about to fall midway through that first corner. Sterry emerged in around about fifth place. Foxhole shot number 12 for Prado, though. Olsen made a better start this time. He was in second. Third was Tom Vial. Fourth was Sterry. The Yamahas of Watson and Kiet were locked together again, but they first had to find their way past Chervelin. Chervelin all of a sudden down to seven. As Geertz once again went after his teammate Watson. Found a way past early on, just like he did in race one. This time, though, he had to go after Sterry. Mitch Evans already riding with a shoulder injury. Wasn't so lucky. He was upside down and out of the race. Geertz made the move on his teammate and then went after Sterry. The pass put the Belgian into four. He then went after Vial for third. This time, Olsen wasn't too far up the track, ahead of him in second. Watson also made his way around the Frenchman to go into fifth place. And Sterry then felt the pressure from his fellow Brit, the Englishman, Watson. This pass was for fourth place in the second half of the race. Sterry eventually rode home for fifth, ahead of his teammate, Jacoby. Once again, though, Geertz locked onto the rear wheel of Olsen. And with two laps to go, he was able to find a way past the Dane for second. Jacoby had to settle for fifth after charging through the field from 22nd on the opening lap. Meanwhile, Maxim Renault eventually came home in eighth place on his Yamaha. 
Gates eventually pulled clear of Olsen, but no one was a match for Jorge Prado this weekend in Latvia. The Spaniard romped home to take win number 15 in race number two on his Red Bull KTM. And with it, his 24th career victory. Gitz second, Olsen third, Watson and Vassen rounding out the top five. Prado now 30 points clear of Olsen, Gitz third, Watson up to fifth after this weekend's performance. But it's Jorge Prado who stood on the top step of the podium so far undefeated in the rounds that he's raced in 2019. Next stop, Teuschenthal, Germany. Welcome back to our studio show, part two here on MXGP TV with myself, Paul Malin, and Lisa Leyland. Uh, our second guest is in. Uh, I mean, it's Jessica, and it's Rockstar Energy Husqvarna Factory Racing. Welcome to our studio show again, uh, AJ. Normally, you're known as Shorty, but I'm sure the dynamic between <laughs> us three, we've got the short one in the middle here. <laughs> but, um, right, let's talk about your season so far. Um, you've just slipped out of the top five in the championship, but either way, uh, and you're only sixth, uh, it's turning out to be your best season ever in MXGP uh, or MX2 with the races that you did before. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, it's uh, it's the best so far. And uh, of course, we slipped out a little bit, a uh, little bit bad luck. But uh, I mean, we are still close when you check with the points, even uh, top three is not far away. And uh, we are still in a fight. And uh, that's just bringing me more motivation to be consistent and make some good results. Mm. Well, you popped up on our radar in MXGP in 2017 uh, or 2016, I think it was, when you first kind of took over the ride from Ben Townley. Mm -hmm. um, last year was tough, but looks like you're back to where you should be and you look like you're really enjoying yourself again. Yeah, I'm, I'm loving it, you know, like uh, making consistent motos. With Suzuki, we a little bit struggled. We had speed, but just those small mistakes always what I made. And this year we seem to be sorted out, but uh, still there is a lot of things to improve. But uh, I'm really enjoying it because being there every weekend, there in the top 10, top five, close close to there, it's uh, it's what I needed, you know? Yeah. Well, your best result so far was Volkensford round three, two fourth place finishes from pretty bad starts, two bad starts. Was that the confidence boost you needed to say, right, I can be a podium contender? Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the, the weekend before already, I showed good in second moto yeah. in, uh, in, in uh, Matterly Basin. So already there, I did really good result in hard pack. So just just proved that uh, I can ride both both kind of tracks. And uh, yeah, Volkenswart uh, seemed to be good, really good. I just uh, ended up tie on points with the third place and finishing two times four and then getting fifth was a little bit kind of a little bit frustrating because I, I really wanted it so bad, but yeah, that just showed that yeah I needed to put some more in first mode because that's what I could do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, more from AJ in a minute, but here's a reminder of our MXGP TV mid-season promo. We've got a great offer on. Just another reminder to let you know that now you can buy the MXGP TV season pass at 50% discount, which also includes the first nine rounds of the MXGP, WMX and EMX. You get to choose how you watch, whether it's live or on demand, including all the qualifying races from MXGP and MX2, all WMX and EMX European races. Also included is the Monster Energy Motocross of Nations in September. You also get to watch us too, myself and Pauline, on our studio show and the 26 minute highlights program Behind the Gate, which is available every Tuesday after each GP. So for more info, check out our website, mxgp.com and enjoy. Thank you for that. They get to see us as well. I know. Well, it's look, the back, best part. back to the show, back yeah. with AJ. Um, I mean, let's, let's talk about Latvia. Um, last week, race one, you looked so promising. Uh, you moved through the field as well, did some pretty good passes uh, until you had that te technical issue. But um, you looked really, really good until then. Yeah, I mean, I mean, also on Saturday, you know, I, I, I had a good speed and... Uh, and in quality race on Saturday, was, uh, I was feeling really good, you know. I, I came through, I passed many guys, and, uh, and I came through to, to second. And then, yeah, the, the Sunday also felt, felt quite good, but just, just was a little bit out of luck, you know. Like, was just, just not good. Like, first moto, a little bit, some, some issues. And then, uh, yeah, second moto was kind of struggling a little bit with the flow. And also, this didn't bring us what, what we really wanted there, but... Uh, 
still it's it's good to learn from from mistakes and all and obviously it's the closest race you have to a home grand prix looked like there was a great deal of support for you as well uh, and a great atmosphere from certainly from the lithuanians who travel but i guess all of the baltic states because you know it's not often they get to cheer for you know one of their own from that sort of whole sort of area uh, especially on saturday it was like really loud yeah of course of course it was uh, it was great support you know not only i mean lutanians they were a lot but uh, i mean all the baltic states they they kind of support each other so which is really nice you know when uh, on the track you could really feel that 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 screaming and that supporting you know so it was a really great feeling and i hope every year it's just gonna grow up good yeah well do you feel aj that another podium is in touching distance of course, we are working on it. You know, we've been uh, we've been already close this year, and uh, it's just pity that I really wanted to have in Latvia one also. You know, because that's been quite a long time I had one, and overall in my pocket I have only one, and I want more. You know, and this season, yeah, my goal is for sure to have one. Yeah. Okay. Well, a couple of questions for you on social media from Inside MX. They say, how does it feel to come from nowhere to now being one of the best riders in the MXGP series? Yeah, I mean, I mean, sometimes it's, you don't even realize that, you know, like one day you just kind of in bed thinking, uh, okay, I'm riding GPs, you know, and there's no one faster who is riding there. So it's, it's actually a crazy feeling, but in, in the end, you still don't really realize. You mm -hmm. just realize in some moments, but then you're so busy with working and everything, just getting better and everything, that in the end, you don't really realize that you're one of the top athletes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, from Lassie Peterson, he says, I think you will be able to be in the top five in the overall classification, but where does he want to be? So where do you want to so finish? Where, yeah, where would you be happy finishing? Yeah, I mean, I mean... This season we came kind of, I was not really expecting too much. I wanted to do really well and everything, but I never put it the, the goal where I finished. But of course, top five is, is the main goal for me to, to finish, but uh, for sure I will fight for more. Okay. Um, okay. Obviously, one major thing happened last week on the sighting lap in uh, MXGP race one. Um, what went through your mind when you came over the jump and saw Jeffrey Lane on the deck. Yeah, first, first of all, I'm would say thankful for flag marshals that they were not sleeping because just just when I my wheels took off, I just saw it really like by the side of my eyes that the flag marshal started to waving, and then I saw in the front Jeffrey just just lying there after the jump. So I was like quite quite shocked because. Normally you don't expect that on sighting lab, but of course it happens. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, it was quite tough to to miss it through and and actually luckily that he didn't start running out of the track or something because then i would hit him even worse so yeah and actually i did not even feel that i even touch him with the wheels so i said okay i was quite quite good save but yeah in the end when you check slow motion video you could see that i a little bit hit with my wheels his his leg yeah yeah and it was obviously unfortunate but uh yeah, I mean, thankfully you didn't crash as well because, as you said, it could have been could have been so much worse. Yeah, yeah. In the end, it could have been much worse, but yeah, it is like it is, and I'm yeah. thankful that it end up maybe this way. It could end up even worse. Sure. Well, look, uh, AJ, thanks for joining us here today. Um, we are out of time, but uh, all the best to AJ for this weekend and the rest of the season as well. Uh, hopefully our third guest is in, Lorenzo Resta. Uh, we'll talk to him in just a couple of moments. Uh, but before we do, here's action from MXGP Race 2 from Latvia one week ago. With no hurlings lining up for race two, everybody else had their eyes on a possible Grand Prix victory. As they charge into the first turn, it was Arno Tonus who took his third Fox Hole shot of the year on the Yamaha, closely followed by Geiser. But from out of nowhere, Jeremy Siwa snuck into the lead. He was closely followed by AJ. Jasikonis ran wide though. Geiser maintained second. Tommy Searle went down and would not rejoin the race. His woes continued. Kai Rowley was the lead KTM rider but his race was cut short over this jump. Whilst in fourth or fifth place, he got sideswiped. He went down, he picked himself up and was narrowly avoided by the chasing pack. A dislocated shoulder, maybe the injury that Kai Rowley was not looking for. 
Siwa was comfortable at the head of the field, though. Tonus, Geiser, Monticelli, Jessiconis, and Van Horbick all gave chase. Relax, focus. Just some of the messages on the boards from the pit crews. And Siwa was in a world of his own. Tonus, possibly realising he could take the overall Grand Prix victory, started to tighten up. Geiser was on the prowl. He closed in in third. And after several attempts, the Honda rider found his way past into second. He then went after Siwa. Van Horvick was solid, sat back in fourth position, but he was being caught by the 461 of Fevre. And Siwa was starting to ride his luck. One or two little mistakes started to creep into the Swiss rider's game. And before long, the Slovenian had broke down the walls. He charged up the inside, scythed his way into the lead on lap 12 of 18. The Slovenian was the new leader. But at this point, Tonus was still the overall winner until this mistake allowed Fevre through. The Yamaha rider number 461 was now into third. He went after his teammate, Jeremy Siwa. The two factory Yamahas battled, and this pass was decisive. It put Fevre on the podium, took his teammate off of the third step of the podium. Geiser went on to win for the tenth time this year. Fevre came home second, Siwa third, Tonus fourth, and the jerryman, Van Horvick, came home in fifth. Geiser was pleased just to have won the race. Fevre thought he'd won the overall. But this tells a different story. Geiser, Fevre and Tonus all shared the same points and it was Geiser because of his victory in race two that came out on top. He now has a 33 point advantage over Tony Cairoli, who we don't know yet if he will line up in Germany. Fevre and Tonus were also on the podium here in Latvia on what was a crazy weekend at Kegemus. What a crazy weekend that was. Kegum's just one week ago, and uh, our third guest is in the house, Lorenzo Resta, uh, journalist from uh, X Off Road. Yeah. Um, Lorenzo, welcome to our studio show. Uh, Thank you. We'll talk about certain things in a moment, but what have you made so far of the season in MX2 and MXGP as we now enter the second half of the season? Uh, it has been a really interesting season uh, so far, uh, with plenty of uh, uh, surprises, uh, I guess. Uh, since uh, the first, the second GP in uh, Great Britain when uh, Prado wasn't racing. Yeah. And in MXGP, we have seen a lot of uh, surprises and actions. And uh, yeah, uh, it, w it has been really, really an interesting beginning of the season. I mean, first half of the season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, um, you work quite closely with Tony um, and, and that team. No Tony here this weekend. What is the latest? Just real quick. Uh, it's just the fact that uh, he, everyone uh, in the team and uh, around him uh, just hope that uh, he could align uh, at the race today. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it wasn't like that. Uh, we were just waiting to see uh, how the progress, uh, how, how the shoulder was progressing. And uh, unfortunately, it wasn't uh, the case. So uh, just uh, uh, the, the uh, we have to wait. Uh, we had uh, several... Uh, checks and uh, we will have it uh, uh, next week in 10 days and uh, and, and see what okay. happened in, in the Well, obviously season. at the beginning of the season, we saw him at his very best. He won the first three GPs. This one in particular, Argentina, was fantastic passing Fevre and Geiser in the space of two or three corners. Um, and it's a shame that he's out. Uh, it's a big shame. It's a big shame. Yeah, I'm looking at these images uh, from Argentina. It looks another era almost. Uh, uh, it's a big shame. That's what was his first time uh, winning a GP in Argentina. Yeah. And that, that passing was crazy. And the, and the waves passing two riders in, I think, 200, 300 meters. Sure. And uh, on, obviously, after Argentina, Tim Geiser came along and spoiled the party. Um, Trentino was a fascinating GP, wasn't it? It was. It was absolutely. It was fascinating because uh, the fight in, between the two top guys of the yeah. MXGP of 2019 was, was great. It was great and uh, the public was great. And I think that once again, it shows that uh, motocross is a different sport starting from the supporters. Mm. The, the, the party of the crowds under the podium was crazy, was fair and, and, and was fantastic. Uh, team deserved that victory that day, uh, it was riding really in a superb way. And uh, uh, but I think at that moment, uh, <coughs> nobody was expecting uh, what then happened after. Mm. 
Well, we then had a five-week break. Uh, Tony came out ready to fight. Tim struggled a bit in Mantova, didn't he? And all of a sudden, Tony had a 40-point lead. But since then, he's, he's been struggling, hasn't he? Yeah, uh, it's uh, just an amount of different things that happened since uh, that day. Uh, after Arco di Trento, this long pause of uh, five weeks was uh, something new for everyone. It uh, was a kind of new restart, a new season after uh, the first uh, GPs. Uh, and the first victories of, uh, of Tony was dominating. Uh, but then um, something happened uh, after, after Mantova in, in Portugal uh, when we were... Honestly, expecting, uh, it's always painful to see those images, mm. <laughs> but yeah. when uh, we were expecting Tony to win the race, uh, uh, mostly, uh, of course, after he won the qualifying race in such a dominating way. Uh, but then two second places with what happened and with a little crash in the second moto was okay. Uh, I mean, everyone was calm and quiet in, uh, under the, the owning. Uh, just, I think, something then happened again in France and that, that really changed the season. Yeah. Well, um, Last weekend, Latvia was a crazy weekend. We saw some of it from the, the highlights clip just a moment ago. Um, Tony out in the second race. Jeff wins the first race and with a broken ankle. Um, Tim wasn't at his best and still won the GP. The Yamahas looked strong. Um, and obviously, the downside of that was uh, Tony left there 33 points down. But obviously, he can't line up today. Um, do we have any idea yet when he could be back? I guess... Yeah, of course, uh, we all hope uh, that he can be back in uh, Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, we have 20 days almost since the crash uh, till uh, we leave for, for Indonesia. So we really hope that uh, he will not be fit 100%. That's almost impossible. But uh, we hope uh, that we dare. We hope to can fight. With Tony, you never know. Honestly, arriving in um, uh, Latvia with that injury that he had in Russia, with the big crash he had in the qualifying race on Saturday, uh, no, nobody of us was expecting a good race from him. Mm. Uh, Saturday was struggling so much. He was struggling with fever, uh, with the cold, with the, and then with the nerve that, uh, um, of his arm. Uh, and he was really struggling all day since the um, free practice. Mm. But then something like uh, we know he can switch in his mind on Sunday. And he did a great, fantastic first race, uh, leading the first laps and then uh, ending in third position, gaining points on Geyser that wasn't so fit. But yeah. I mean, uh, he's still uh, really good. And then everyone was really positive for the second moto. Mm. Uh, and what happened, nobody was expecting, honestly. Sure. Well, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, talk about two riders. Yes. Um, it's not all doom and gloom, though, for KTM. Prado, on the other hand, is doing a great job in MX2. Yeah, yeah, he's doing something incredible. Uh, there's a huge amount of work uh, from all the group that is around Jorge, that is the same that is around uh, Tony, uh, that proves that this group can go do something incredible. Of course, uh, Jorge has a brilliant talent. It's, mm. uh, it's fantastic rider, but uh, it was a kind of a raw gem, and uh, with, the, with Claudio and the team, they transformed him in, in a really shiny diamond uh, that is doing something incredible, winning all the GPs uh, he did this year, uh, and all the motos uh, are part of the first moto in, in France, and that's mm. great. Well, it was good um, you mentioned that. Yeah. And um, <laughs> what have you made of Yago's performance? Because he's the only rider to have beaten Prado in the first race in France. Is that something that surprising? I think, yeah, I think that um, nobody is surprised about the speed of Yago because already last year it showed that uh, um, it, it can be really, really fast and quick. But uh, everyone is surprised about uh, the, cost, the constancy that uh, he is made on because he's now really, really fast and he's always there. He's fighting for the pole, final podium of the MXGP and maybe he can fight for something more even. Uh, but um, this kid I think is uh, um, represent the future of the MX2 class mm. in the best way possible. Yeah. Well, obviously, he's more known for being a sand rider, but you know he has been on the podium this year in the hard, and obviously he took a race win there in the hard as well. Yeah, yeah, that's the, the, the biggest surprise. The way he has grown uh, compared to the last seasons, uh, where he was really fast on the, mostly the sand. Mm. Now he is also really fast uh, in the. Um, 
on, on the hard pack, mm -hmm. and he's able to to push till the end what he demonstrated in, uh, in France is the way he won the first model. Okay, okay well, look, uh, Lorenzo Resta from uh, X Off Road, thanks for joining us here today. We Thank are you. out of time, unfortunately. Uh, we'll take a two week break when we arrive. It'll be for the MXGP in, of Indonesia uh, in Palembang, and then we go to Semarang the week after for MXGP of Asia. But uh, join us today uh, live. Uh, 150 is the EMX 125 first race, and then from 4 o'clock we have EMX 250, MX2, and MXGP qualifying. Uh, that's it from our studio show here in Germany. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. Thank you.